things. They're beautiful. They're great gifts too. All right, that's enough about Hanumiel. Okay, all right, I'll stop talking about Hanumiel. Um, anyway, we're super excited to have Evan with us today. Hopefully you guys will join us for the Community Postcard Project on Sunday. And uh, Evan, let's learn about, you know, scan to print. One of the questions we get more than any at Looking Glass is how you go through this process. Which so. is pretty cool because print was dead and film was dead, but here we are. Here we so, are. That's so throughout this, my goal of these presentations is always to have it more of a, a class and kind of a Q&A. So I think we're taking questions in the chat. So if you have a question, put it in there in the chat. Jen will kind of moderate those. Uh, she'll jump in, you know, in between slides or whatever else. And, and this is more of an overview. We're not gonna get into the really deep technical stuff because there's a whole lot of that. And, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for self-exploration when it comes to scanning. There's, there's settings and options and what fits your work and what are you shooting and, and all those things. So this is gonna be a, like a launch pad, give you some foundational tools, give you some ideas. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about post-production of the scans and then kind of jump into a little bit of printing and what kind of papers are reminiscent of the dark room and what works well for black and white scans and that sort of thing. And then, like I said, we'll do, we'll do the Q and A as we go along. And then obviously at the end, we can, we can do any more questions or anything else like that. So if you have questions, hit us with it. And I'm going to jump into the PowerPoint. There it is. All right. So I actually, um, Worked with Moab, I think for about nine years now, started out doing a couple of store demos and then slowly over the years built up my, my skills and my knowledge and, and then I've had the opportunity lately to, to, to share it with all of you. And that's been, that's been a lot of fun because me with a head full of facts doesn't, <laughs> doesn't do anybody any good. But long before that, I actually started out in the darkroom. I grew up with a darkroom in the house and, and that's where my love of photography really started out. And I remember when I was probably three years old, I'd get to go down there when my dad was printing and, and hit the print button on the larger timer. And it was that, that big square Bessler digital timer. We had the digital one with the glow in the dark print button. And then, you know, you put it in the developer and as a kid watching that image appear is, is pure magic. And although it's different to me still, watching that image come out of the inkjet printer is also pure magic because I have no idea how that works. How does it get those little tiny droplets of ink on that paper over and over and over again? I'm not an engineer. It's, you know, it, it's, it's brighter. It smells better in my office than it does in the dark room, but it, it's still a pretty cool process. So I shot a lot of film. I souped a lot of film. Um, and then as time went by, we started to scan film. And actually over the last couple of years, I've been going through my archive and scanning it and finding some old gems, family trips. I think this was spring break, probably when I was in middle school. Uh, this was a really fun one. This is a roll of film that my aunt, aunt and uncle exposed sometime in the early 70s or mid 70s and it sat in a camera until two years ago so you can see all the spidering and the emulsion and so this sat undeveloped for for 40 years and that was a fun one to find and then uh cannon beach was a perennial vacation spot and so we still try to get back there when we can and, and i always like to shoot film so even though and i probably don't have to tell any of you this because you've tuned into this class but even though i do shoot almost every day, um, many digital cameras, all that sort of thing. I, I really enjoy film because when you're shooting film, you're forced to relax and to be creative. If I'm shooting digital, I'm looking at the screen, looking at the histogram, did I do it right? Where's the highlights, all that stuff. When you shoot film, you snap the photo and you say, well, in a week, I'll, I'll see what I got. And it's, I think it's really freeing creatively when you work so much in a, in a digital workflow because it, it puts you back to that old focusing on composition and, and exposure and, and kind of frees your mind to think about the art versus the tech. So what do we want to go over today? Uh, preparing film, uh, scanner settings for color and black and white, scanning resolution, how do you know what those numbers mean? Um, test and experiment is, is always when you're learning something new. Image file processing, which is, which is pretty simple, but as you get into it, you know, you find the nuances and then selecting paper and printing because the whole point of scanning it is not to put it on Instagram. We want to put it up on the wall. So that's, and that's what brings us around to, as I always say, you know, when we shot film, we didn't take our little strips over to people's houses and hold them up and say, oh, you know, frame number 19. I love that shot. What do you think? Well, no, no, you took over prints. So to me, you know, 
like Instagram or your, your phone photos are the equivalent of the negative strip. It's nice, they look at it, they move on. But when you bring them a print, even if it's a small print, even if it's just an eight by 10, you know, I did it this afternoon, I didn't obsess over it. If you bring that over to someone's house, it's a gift, it's a, a captured memory, it's a place, it's a time. And so that print is what immortalizes our work and also um, teaches us a lot about our work. So we'll, we'll get to that later, but anything yet? Anybody ask anything yet? Jen's muted. I know it's mostly just, just comments. You know, print has never died and the mystery of film is what keeps me interested for sure. Perfect. Like, All right. The fun. So it's, you know, we're just engaging because everybody does love this. It is fun. All right. So preparing your film. Um, if you have a scanner, you'll already know this. If you're buying a scanner, keep this in mind, but have your film prepped to fit your scanner. So most scanners do six, six frame strips. If you're shooting 35 millimeter, if you're shooting medium format, sometimes it's three frames, sometimes it's individual frames. So keep that in mind when you get your film processed. Um, some scanners, probably not ones that are on the market now will take a full uncut roll, but I think that's, I think that's over and gone. Um, keep it clean. That's the biggest thing. You know, the scanner is very high resolution and we'll get to in the, in a couple more slides, but at a 6,400 DPI scan, you can make a 2436 from a 35 millimeter frame. Well, we could never make a 2436 in the dark room, not never, but it was hard. So keep in mind that as you're enlarging that, you know, you're capturing every bit of dust or scratch or, or whatever else. So when you get the film back, if you're ready, you know, pop it in the scanner, do your scans, put it in the, in the negative sleeves. But I've even found taking film in and out of my archival plastic sleeves, I can get little scratches on it. Uh, don't use canned air when you're cleaning your film because you don't know what's in there and you can freeze it and you can do all sorts of things. So just the good old blower, little hand rocket blower, um, a camel hair brush or something else. I, I think you guys carry all this stuff. And, and some sort of cotton gloves, inspection gloves, you know, it just keeps the oils from your hands from getting transferred into the film. Obviously we always try to handle it from the edge, but you know, I've dropped it on my desk, I've dropped it on the floor, I've whatever else, and then I got to pick it up and clean it off. And so just, you know, treat that film kind of reverently as you, as you work through it. Skip one, we didn't skip one. Okay, so if you have a scanner or if you're thinking about a scanner, get to know your scanner because this is gonna help you out a lot down the road. First of all, you wanna find the optical resolution of the scanner. So you can go below that or scanners will also let you go above that to what they call interpolated DPI. Well, interpolated just means the software is faking data that's not there. So the best thing you can do quality wise is to scan at the optical DPI of your scanner because that's capturing data one-to-one. -one, and then afterwards in the file, you can reduce it if it's too big, or for some reason, if you want, you can enlarge it, but you wanna leave those decisions up to yourself. So the optical data will be listed in the specs or in the, um, in the user's guide, or you can do a quick search online because a lot of people have gone over this. So the, the two scanners that I happen to have are Funny enough, both discontinued, but the Epson V500 is a, a flatbed that's equivalent to the V600 that's out now. That has an optical resolution of 6400. And then the old Nikon LS4000 film scanner has a, has a resolution of 4000 DPI. So I always scan at those resolutions. So if we look right below here, a 35 millimeter frame at 6400 DPI scanned will give you a 6, 20, 16 by 24 print or even a 2436 print, which is amazing. Whereas if you have that and scan it at 3200, or if you reduce the file size afterwards, you can still make a 12 by 18 at 240, which is about the minimum pixels an inch. And if you look at this, we have dots per inch because that's the scanner physically measuring the film. And then we have pixels per inch once it's digital because that's how many pixels you're feeding the printer to print per inch of paper. So that can often be confusing, but we use DPI when we talk about physical objects and we use PPI, pixels per inch, when we talk about digital files and output and that sort of thing. Um, you will notice that these do create large files. I'm more of an archivist and a, a believer that the future will give us better tools. So just like we always shoot raw files in our cameras, 
you know, you're going to scan this stuff at 6,400. Well, you're going to get a big file, 100 megabytes, 200 megabytes. So that's up to you as to whether do you scan all your film and then cull it? Do you scan it all and then maybe reduce the ones you're not sure about? That's a that's sort of a personal archiving decision. But these days with with hard drives being as inexpensive as they are, you know, it's it's nice to have that sort of future proof on these because you're probably going to keep these files around for a long time. So another note, whether you're scanning color or black and white, you always want to scan in 16 bit. And what 16 bit does is it gives us a lot more data. If we're looking at just shades of gray, an 8 bit file, which is sort of a standard JPEG, has the potential for 256 shades of gray. Well, a 16 bit file takes that up to 65,000 shades of gray. So a lot more data. And if you're looking in your scanner software, it'll say 8 bit gray, 16 bit gray. And then as you go down the list, you'll see 24 bit color, 48 bit color. It might say 64 bit color, but it'll probably say 64 bit I for interpolated. Again, software magic. So for color scans, you want to use 48 bit color because in a scanner, it's red, green, blue, RGB, and that is 16 bits per channel. So again, you're going to get a big file, but you're going to have all that data to work with. So again, if space is a big issue for you or you're not quite sure if you want to archive this stuff, you can do an 8-bit JPEG scan, which is a lot less data. Or in some scanner software, you can do what's called a size reduction. So it will scan at 6400 and then combine the pixels and output a smaller file. And the advantage of that is you're getting all, all of that original data. And then the software is distilling it down, kind of like when you go from 4K to 1080p video, it's keeping more data because you have more to work with in the original file. So Evan, we did get hit up with a couple, uh, like actually a series of questions um, yeah. from one person. And uh, we've got Andy hoping for more tips on keeping the scanner clean because two dogs. Um, and I know, I feel your pain. I have a golden retriever and a Newfoundland and there could not be more fur. Um, and then uh, followed up with um, going over making files smaller post scan because post scan because they tend to scan lower at a lower PPI, and then rescan um, if they need anything bigger. So I, I guess that's the two main things in there. Yeah. 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 So it's for keeping the scanner clean, you you have an advantage that like an inkjet printer, we always say you need to keep that plugged in at all times. Um, so it can do cleaning and whatever else. A scanner, you don't need to keep it plugged in. So you could go so far as to put it in a, a large you know, plastic bag or cover it in a sheet of plastic. You could put it on a shelf somewhere, um, anything like that. And, and obviously if the glass gets dirty or whatever else, just use lens cleaning solution and a, and a microfiber cloth treat. Treat all this stuff like you would treat a camera lens or, or whatever else like that. Meaning you can easily clean it, but don't use Windex or whatever else. So, and, and then keep it shut and put away when you're not using it, right? You don't want to leave it on your desk. It's nice to have a desk trophy, but I did send my Micon scanner in for repair a year or two ago. And <laughs> the guy sent me some photos of the dust that he accumulated inside, which was a bit embarrassing. Oh, wow. And do you, so we always recommend actually also keeping an anti-static cloth on hand um, to, to hit the surface because it's microfiber and then it's got a treatment to actually help it repel dust. Yeah, you know, I live in Seattle, so the humidity um, doesn't lend itself to static very often. <laughs> so uh, it, absolutely, I think that's probably geographically dependent, but nothing wrong with with the less static, the better in, in everything that we do. So yeah, I, I would totally agree. Um, oh, and then uh, resolution and rescanning. I think that kind of depends on your workflow and, and how much time you have. If if it works for you to scan a roll and say, hey, there's four frames in here that I want high res and then go back and pick those and, and scan them again, there's nothing wrong with that. Or if you have the space number one and the discipline number two of scanning that whole roll at high res and then immediately culling the files that you're not going to keep, you know, really either one works. Hopefully that answers that question. And there were two other little pieces before we jump back in. Um, do you, so nitrile gloves, any benefits to using nitrile gloves if you don't have cloth ones? And I'm just gonna quickly say, we also sell at Looking Glass anti-static gloves, which are what I personally recommend, again, to repel that dust. 
uh, anything is going to be anything that's a barrier between your oily skin and that film is going to be a plus. So if you, you know, back in April bought yourself 10,000 pairs of nitrile gloves, as long as they're not powdered, that'll be just fine. Uh, obviously you don't want to just be handling the film all over the place, but, but yeah, anything that's a barrier between you and, and the film is good. You know, we always like the cotton gloves or the antistatic gloves or the, even the nylon inspection gloves, I think are what I have here because they're comfortable for long-term wear. So if I'm doing a bunch of prints or if I'm working with a bunch of film, I can, I can wear them for an hour. Just remember that you're not, Hey, I've got my glove on. I'm going to scratch my eye and then I'm going to pick up my coffee cup. And no, that's like, that's your, that's your barrier, right? So if you use your film and then take it off and set it next to the scanner and then do your thing and then come back. Like don't start typing a lot with your gloves on because you have uh, months, years, or decades of, of finger grease on that keyboard. <laughs> so you're going to quickly foul those gloves. So that's, that's something to keep in mind for sure. Okay. And then Tim wanted to know, he said, did he hear you recommend using 3,400 DPI on a V600 scanner? Um, no, I had put 3,200 in here just because it's half of the 64. So if you, two things, if you're looking at a lower res scanner, so for instance, again, they're not made, but the Nikon that I have scans at, at 4,000, it's a little more than 3,200, but it gets you the idea of, hey, you can easily do a 12 by 18 print at, at very nice quality. Um, so you kind of have to look at if you're buying a scanner, most of them, these guys, these days do default at 6,400, but for some reason, if they don't, it gives you a sense of the max print size you can make from that biggest scan. Or if you're, if you're scanning at 6,400 and you're going to do a two to one reduction, you would end up at, at 3,200 and, and those print sizes. So awesome. awesome. Somebody did ask what view scan is. Um, another person. We're going to get to that in just awesome. a second. Perfect. So the biggest thing as you go through this is to take notes. You got to remember film is, is analog scanning is sort of analog. So it takes us back to the old darkroom tradition of the notepad with temperatures and exposure times and, and, uh, is it RC4 paper? Is it RC3 paper? That sort of thing. So you're going to want to make notes to find your best settings. And you're going to, you're going to set aside a couple evenings or a couple Saturdays or whatever else to, to take a couple of film frames that are, you know, good density negatives. If you have color and black and white, you're going to want to do this for both of them. But you're going to, you're going to do some repeated scans of the same frame, changing the tone curve and changing the, the, the max black and the max white and the exposure and that sort of thing, because these scanners are all inherently a little different. It's sort of like different cameras, you know, expose a little differently or different lenses give us a little different qualities. Well, a, a scanner is the same way because you're dealing with a, an optical object and software. So there's not just a, a, a set it and forget it out of the box scanning that, that works very well if you want to do post-production on your, on your scans. So, you know, we've got multi-pass, we've got multi-exposure, we've got all sorts of things. And when you're evaluating those files, you want to look at them, you know, fit on your screen. And then you also want to look at them at hundred percent and look at the film grain and look at the, the shadows and the highlights, you know, do, do your highlights kind of fall off when they shouldn't, when there's still data in the film, are your shadows all chunky? Um, is there a lot of dust on there? You know, do you need to pull it out and, and, and brush it again or blow it again or Maybe it's old film and it's got a lot of damage and you need to really work on, you know, if I keep increasing the digital cleaning in the scan software, at what point is it like noise reduction, right? It kind of falls off. So, so think of your concepts. Um, digital noise reduction is sort of the same as film cleaning, right? At some point, there's a, an inherent loss of quality in, in that much torture of your, of your files. So, so work through this, use the file names. To take notes, if you're if you're savvy with metadata, you can put a whole bunch of things in the metadata. So you scan the frame and then you open it, and in, and in the notes you you put in, you know, uh, light tone curve, so much sharpening, so much of this, so much of that. And then as you do that and you compare the files, you'll get a sense of what settings are are golden for your workflow and for your film, and you can actually save those as presets in the in the software. And then. People will ask about color calibration or scanner calibration on the less expensive scanners. It's kind of difficult to do and it doesn't work that well. I tried doing some scanner calibration with this V500 and got really undesirable results. If you step up to like the Epson 850, 
uh, that actually comes with some calibration targets because it's designed to do that. So you can't really push the scanner into territory that it's not designed to go into. So a, just kind of a quick little run here. So this was a 20 year old Fuji frame. That's, that's me in the, in the Navy shirt um, down at Cannon Beach. And that's actually my, my wife. She was not my wife then, but it's been, yeah. 20 years and change, which is a lot of fun. So it was fun to go back and look at this stuff. But what's interesting about this is this is two different scanners and two different softwares with the default settings. So you can see here how your film appears in your scans, at least at default, varies greatly based on what the scanner is designed to do. So the Epson V500 is a 200 and well, it's been replaced by the V600, which is a $230 uh, flatbed prints or negatives. And you can see it's designed to do kind of a print ready file, right? It's fairly contrasty. It's got pretty decent quality along. Um, so, so they're sort of anticipating with their default settings that you're going to do less manipulation. You just want to do a final scan. Looks great. We're done. Uh, so view scan is a software that's been developed that lets you use scanners that are no longer supported. So for instance, that Nikon, Film scanner was discontinued a decade ago at least. Uh, it's FireWire. There's no computer that ships with FireWire anymore. So this, this guy went back and, and reverse engineered a lot of scanner drivers and opened up our ability to use older scanners, but also it's, it's a software rich with options. So if you buy, say, an Epson V600, it would be worth testing ViewScan because you can do multi-pass, multi-exposure. You can do that file size reduction where it scans it at 6,400, processes it, and then gives you a, a more detailed 3,200 DPI file. Um, it, it's got a huge number of options. You can do tone curves. It has film profiles built in, all that sort of thing. I think it's under 100 bucks for the software. So if you're going to do any reasonable amount of scanning, I think it's a very good investment. But you can see between those two, it gives you, the view scan gives you a much flatter file, sort of like log video that gives you a lot of latitude in post to use curves and other adjustments to, to get more detail out of your shadows or your highlights or that sort of thing. And then what was interesting is to look at the, the LS4000, which we have to use ViewScan. And, and again, it's a, it's a very different file, even though this is exactly the same negative. So in, these are all the, the default options. So it just kind of gives you a sense that no two scanners are going to be the same and no two pieces of software using the same scanner are going to be the same. So we'll, we'll kind of start out with this to, this is just a really brief workflow. I don't know if any of you tuned into the black and white printing webinar on, on Monday, but he did kind of the same thing to a much greater depth than this. So we're looking at a black and white scan. This was done. Um, actually I did it both ways, but I think this file is from the Nikon. So again, this is the same exercise with the black and white scan. We have Epson's default on the left, which you can see has a fair amount of contrast already. Um, a little aggressive, I think, in the shadows for me. The center one is the view scan, which is kind of flattening it out. And then third is the, is the Nikon with the view scan. And what was interesting to see is the, the Epson out of the box uses a plastic film holder that holds it kind of above the scanner glass a little bit. And the, the disadvantage of that is it leaves a dish to your film. So if your film is curved at all, that is not gonna flatten it out. And you see that when you look at 100% scan. So this is out of the Epson and this is out of the Nikon. So in the Nikon, you can see the film grain, whereas in the Epson, it's a little smooshy. So this is not a knock it against the Epson. It's a simple design flaw that's actually easily overcome with a little piece of, um, call it anti-Newton glass, and, and I'll get to that in a minute. So if you get a flatbed film scanner, or if you have a flatbed film scanner, and you're getting something that looks a little like this one, it's because your negative isn't staying flat or isn't flat at all throughout the scan process. So again, flatbed film scanner holders generally don't keep your film flat. Again, if you get the, the Epson 850, that actually you can get an optional um, fluid mount to keep your scan completely flat and, and that reduces diffraction and other things like that. But you can use an anti-Newton glass to keep your negatives flat. So you can actually on these flatbed scanners, put your film right on the flatbed glass, put the anti-Newton glass right on top. As long as you get it in the right spot, it'll treat it just like there's a film holder in there. 
Um, there's a little company online called ScanTech. They make pre-cut sheets for just about every scanner you can think of. So you just order, I think it's 20 bucks for a piece of glass or whatever. And then you put that on top of your film again, scan it, and, and you'll eliminate this issue of um, soft focus on your film. One quick uh, question is, uh, do you have a program that you recommend for comparing scans? Uh, because they used to use Bridge, but don't have it anymore. And uh, just want to find a way to compare without having to import the already scanned files into Lightroom. Um, well, if you're paying for a Lightroom subscription, do you get Photoshop? I don't remember. I think you do. I think Maybe it depends on which package you've got. I mean, I've got, you know, just straight up Adobe CC photo package, and that includes, you know, Bridge, Photoshop, and Lightroom. Um, and so if you've only got Lightroom, I don't know if that would also include. Hmm. But it's um, like you could probably use like Apple's preview. I don't know how much, I don't know if that actually shows a one-to-one -one pixel representation at hundred percent. I'm not sure. Um, what else? You know, if you're, well, if you're using Lightroom, you're probably not going to want photo mechanic because that kind of accomplishes the same thing without a catalog. What do you use? I use, I use Photoshop and I'm starting to use capture one as well. So, but then I, you know, I have, a lot of imaging programs because I have to know them all. Right. What I would say with Lightroom is you can, instead of doing the copy to catalog, you can just add it. So it leaves the scan wherever it is and then imports, you know, the, the preview and puts it in your catalog. And, and maybe you make a separate sub catalog for your film scans, or you make a, you know, a quick project file. And then if you haven't, if you're not importing those files and you're just adding them, when you remove them from Lightroom, it doesn't delete them out of the catalog, but it also doesn't add that full size file into the catalog. So you can kind of make a working folder for your scan tests, you know, add that to Lightroom, look at those, manipulate them. And then when you're done, delete those out of Lightroom and then just, you know, re-import the ones that you've decided to keep based on your settings or just start fresh once you've got your settings down, you're ready to scan and then import those scans into Lightroom. It's probably the best way to handle it because Great I don't- question you know, with, with, uh, image apps from your operating system vendor, Microsoft or Apple, it's hard to be sure if they're giving you the actual pixels or if they're kind of dressing it up because a lot of these apps now want to dress up your photos. So they look as good as possible on the screen. And you don't know what sort of, uh, magic is going on behind the scenes that might not be positive magic. Yeah. So again, I'm going to, come back to it, you know, experiment and, and make sure you take notes because unlike digital camera metadata, it's not going to tell us what our aperture and our film speed was when we, when we look at this scan, Hey, what did we do? So, you know, tone curves in the software, um, gamma, which is the kind of the amount of contrast data you have again, white and black points. And if we look at grain reduction, sharpening, dust removal, how much is too much, how much is not enough. And, and you'll kind of, as you scan more film, and if it's new film, you probably don't have to do much of this. If it's old film, you'll get a sense of, hey, I know that negatives from, you know, that my parents shot are all scratched up because they didn't have archival practices 50 years ago when they were taking these photos. And also some of these, some of these softwares to varying degrees of success offer color restoration and fading restoration. And that's another one of those things you'll see turning it on and off. And it's, it's, you know, software settings that are sort of based on how a film is expected to age, but there's not a slider for, Hey, this is Kodak gold. That's 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old. It's a, it's a, it's a sort of an on off setting. So it might overcorrect. It might undercorrect. Again, that's something you can play with, but, but always remember when you're making these selections at the time of the scan, you're baking that data into the file and you can't go back later and, and turn off that um, color restoration in the file because that decision was made by the scanning software. So again, pick a frame representative of your work or of the film you're scanning, scan it multiple times and, and look at all those variables and see what, what looks the best. Can, can you explain briefly, Evan, what a, a tone curve is? Yeah, so I think, 
here, we can kind of look at this and I can go into Photoshop and, and we'll look at this file too. So this was the original scan out of the scanner. Pretty flat, not very interesting. At first blush, you're like, no, that's, that's not really what I had in mind. Well, that's because we've, we've scanned it fairly flat to retain the data. And what that means is our highlights are not gonna be blown out or we're not gonna lose the data that's in the negative in our highlights because we're not trying to scan those all the way to white. And in our shadows, we're gonna keep some of the data that's in the shadows because we're not trying to push it all the way down to black. So then when you pull it into Photoshop, the first thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna make kind of an, an S curve, which darkens the shadows and either darkens or brings up the highlights based on what you wanna do. So maybe we just go look at that right now. Let's see. I think I have to stop on that. and then go to Photoshop. And hopefully... We can totally see it, perfect. And can you see the, the curves here? Okay, so the first curve layer, you can see is a pretty dramatic, I'll turn the rest of these off. So this was our original scan. So that first curves layer, is this sort of dished curve that you can see. And with the mask, it's only applied to the foreground. It's not applied to the sky. But again, that brings out a lot of that detail that we don't see in the original scan. And then the sky was a little too bright for me. So I took this mask and inverted it. So it was an exact opposite selection and did a second, which I can see it here. You probably can't see it on the zoom, but it just darkens the sky a little bit. So you can see based on this histogram that that is only applied to my really bright highlights. And I just brought them down just a little bit. And then this was the file that I was left with and it looks pretty good, but it didn't have the density that I wanted. It looks kind of halfway there. So then I did a third one that just, you can see kind of darkens overall. And if we look at that, it's a little bit of it. So I, I brought in the shadows a little bit in the, in the absolute blacks because that original scan that you saw was um, pretty, pretty light, pretty flat. There's no data in the absolute blacks. So if we move that slider over, I'm not clipping any data, I'm not clipping any pixels. And this is just a soft curve. So again, um, Lightroom doesn't allow you to do multiple curve adjustments. So you kind of have to do that in Photoshop, but by using layers here, I can go back and turn any of these off and I haven't affected the original file. This is sort of like you're putting um, filters over your original file to have it look different. And, and I always like layers. They don't increase the file size very much and it allows you to come back you know, in a year and say, ah, I wanna change this or I'm using a different paper or whatever else and, and make different decisions about your file. Obviously you can save versions, but then you end up with so many versions of a file it, that just gets confusing to me. So this was, this was that in practice to give you a sense of those curves. Great, thank you, Evan. That was really Absolutely. helpful. Um, just one quick one. Um, is there a difference between scanning color negatives and slides? So I mostly scan, oh, color negatives and slides. Likely your color slides, because slide film always had a little less latitude and it was a little more finicky than um, color negative. So again, that's going to be uh, something for you to experiment on. I have very little, very few chromes here that I've scanned and the ones that I did scan were a while ago before I had really drilled into this. So I don't have really distinct advice on that. There's a, there's a very good article from a few years back on Luminous Landscape about scanning kind of batch scanning film and, and the author of that goes through some settings so that might be something to look for. I'll see if we can find the, 
the link to that. Um, but there are some good articles online if you really want to kind of dig deep into settings or other things like that for specific, you know, color transparency, color negative, black and white negative. And then uh, view scan also gives you the option of a lot of uh, um, uh, transparency profiles in the scanning option. So that might help bring up the most in some of those films. Yeah, and Tim says uh, he found negative reversals to be quite challenging where positive slides are simpler, particularly with old negs or poorly exposed ones. And I'm sure that has everything to do with that um, base color. That's just what yeah, you're and, sitting and on. Yeah, and I found an article where somebody actually goes in and you can measure the base color of the emulsion and then use um, a layer to remove it from the scan. You can even... View scan allows you to save the raw data, which is actually a scan of the negative in negative. And then you can go in and, and do a do an inversion and make those adjustments yourself. But that's the, you know, that's the 300 level film scan class that is way above my knowledge base. But it it does really open you up that if if you want to spend a lot of time, you know, really perfecting these scans or you have some work that is of a huge value to you and you want to work on it versus having a lab. You know, maybe do a couple of drum scans. Um, that would be something to to dig into, but that's definitely above the the view of this class and and my experience. And in the chat, in case anybody's wondering, there there are recommendations for for softwares. Negative Lab Pro. Um, somebody sent me separately Silverfast, which I believe actually came with the Pro level Epson flatbed scanner. A light version of Silverfast does come with the Pro level. I I looked at both. So View Scan is. Um, made by Hamrick. I don't know where my here. Oh, actually I'll not run that page right now comparing software. So ViewScan runs, I think 90 or hundred bucks. Uh, Silverfast runs about 500. So you really have to be dedicated and, and have some ROI on your film. I think if you're going to spend 500 bucks on a software, I've had very good luck with, with ViewScan with both the Epson flatbed and obviously the Nikon film scanner. And I think at, at 90 to hundred dollars, it's, for me, it was kind of a, a no brainer because it works really well and, and it's not a huge investment. So, but those are the only two that I've explored. The other ones, I'm sure there are more out there. I haven't done any work with them. We've got um, one question that came in about a terminology you've been using. Um, does scanning flat mean at default settings? Uh, no, so mainly scanning flat, what I was trying to go back to is, and let me, let me grab a, I'm gonna pop off the camera for a sec. So this is the negative carrier from the Epson scanner. And you can see on the bottom here is where you'd put your mounted um, transparencies. And then these two strips above hold six strips of film. And they're, can they're empty. That? Do you mind uh, not sharing your screen for just a second so that we can see it big? Oh, yeah. Hold on. Thank you. I'm back. Perfect. Perfect. All right, so you can see that there's film in the bottom one. The top one is empty. Um, but if you look at that kind of on edge, and of course it's gonna focus on me, but that film in there is, it's curved, right? It, it film curves a little bit over time. And so even though this is holding the edges, there's no, there's no sandwich. So the film dishes. And film scanners generally have a depth of field of less than a millimeter. So the film doesn't have to curve very much to have it be out of focus. So when I say, usually when I've been saying scanning flat, you want to keep your film flat. That's where we talked about the anti-Newton glass. Now, the second thing is <laughs> kind of mixing terminology. You want to get a low contrast file out of the scanner, which is also kind of called a flat file. So my apologies for that. So we'll call it a low contrast scan because that gives you more latitude in post. I don't know if any of you shoot digital video, but it, a step up from just out of the camera is to shoot what's called log. And log gives you a low contrast file that again, just like our film scans, 
we have a lot of latitude to add in post. So I don't have a, I, I try not to mix too many terms in here, but um, normally a tone curve in a photo is, is kind of an S curve, right? We want to increase the shadows and we want to reduce the highlights. So if you look at a, at a, um, at a curves layer, This last one that I did kind of gives you a sense of that, right? We're gonna we're gonna reduce, we're gonna darken the shadows, and we're gonna lighten the highlights a bit. So that's that's an extreme version of it. But a flat tone curve flattens the contrast in the image. So I think we should. I'll try to be a little more specific that that we want a low contrast file out of the scanner. We don't want a high contrast file because then all those decisions have been made for us. So I hope that clears up um, that confusion. Sorry about that. Um, any thoughts about the the fact that the the film holder for the scanner crops the edges of the negatives? Because um, we got somebody who hates that. So if you don't like that, again, you don't have to use. This is just a a physical guide that that puts your film in the right spot. So, and the sweet spot on these. Epson scanners is down the middle, right? You have to take the um, the reflective white backdrop out of there, and then it has a, a a backlight that moves along that top track. So if you're just going to use this for film, you can actually, you know, take a dry erase marker and 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 draw two parallel lines where that film track is. And then just set your film right on the scanner glass, like we talked about. You don't have to use the film holder. So if you want that look of the film data or the sprockets or whatever else, and this is especially where that that little anti-Newton glass would help, you can put your film right on the glass, no negative holder required, put that glass on top, and then you'll get that sort of classic scan or classic darkroom contact print look where you get all the all the film data in the in the image file. Awesome. There are other questions, but I think we're going to save them for the end because they're getting specific about, you know, different types of scanners. And, and so. Got it. Go ahead. Um, keep going. Yeah. So back to what we talked about, Epson scan by default creates a higher contrast file, which is perfect if you want to just scan it and be done. Or if you're, you know, quickly scanning stuff, it's not a file that you necessarily want if you're going to really rework your scans. So then you're going to go into Epson scan and you're going to mess with that tone curve. Um, and then by default, view scan and I'm sure Silverfast create a flatter file for editing. Sorry, a lower contrast file for editing. So similar, like we said, to S log video. View scan also includes profiles for different films. So you can say, hey, this is this is Fuji Super HG 1600. And then the software is pre-programmed to kind of know how much grain is going to be in that and what the degradation over time might be and all that sort of thing. And then you can also use what are called IT8 targets or scanner targets. Again, I'm not going to get into that because I'm not an expert on that. But you can build your own film profiles. So if you're shooting, um, I think Velvia, does Velvia still exist? I used to shoot that a lot. Or if you're shooting, I'm thinking like Port Port Portra 160. And yes, right? you does. love that as a, <laughs> as a color film these days. So you can go ahead and build a profile for Portra 160 for your scanner so that that is as accurate as possible. It's it's very similar to profiling your monitor or using an ICC profile when you're printing. The scanner then knows exactly what the tones are in that negative. It knows where the where the highlights fall off. It knows where the shadows turn pure black. And so if you're scanning a whole lot of one film, it might be worth the time to make a profile for that to get those to to get those scans as, as best as you can. Because it's just like you're just like exposing film in the camera we have to do all that work. It's not like a raw file where we can go change it a stop and a half when we get back to edit. Um, your scanner is basically a, an imaging device capturing your film. So you want to get those settings as dialed in as you can at the point of capture and not try to reverse engineer it in software. Because scanned files, though they have a lot of latitude, we kind of treat them a little more like JPEGs in that we can't go nuts and edit them like a raw file because the data is just not there. You know, you made all those decisions in the camera, 
which is kind of why you shot the film. And again, uh, ViewScan is available from hamrick.com, works with all these scanners, does a great job. They have a demo, I think, but it's, it's only a $90 or $100 piece of software. So again, these are the two flatbed scanners that I've used. Um, the Perfection B600, which I know you guys try to stock as much as you can. The 850, which we think you can get, but again, like webcams and everything else, scanners are extremely hard to get right now because all of us photographers stuck at home with film think, hey, I'd love to scan my film. Um, looking at the specs, they do both have the same optical DPI spec. Granted, the V850 has separate lenses for film and for flatbed scanning and significantly better image processing. So you do see a big jump in quality for the big jump in price. Um, but again, this is, you know, how much film are you going to scan? What are those scans worth to you? And, and how much do you want to spend on the scanner? Uh, the V600 will do up to um, 120 film, as far as I know, and the Perfection will do up to four by five. So if you're shooting true medium format or whatever else, that's a great way to capture it. And the Perfection does come with a, a special version of Silverfast. So you get a lot of those options that we've talked about, kind of the advanced editing stuff that's not present in Epson scan. And if you're looking at ViewScan or if you've used it, it does work well with both of these scanners as well. So now that you've gotten your scan done and you've edited your file, what do we do with it? Well, we have to print it. So how do we how do we start there? And and if we were in the in the classroom, I'd do a show of hands. How many of you print? Hopefully a lot of you do or, or use a lab, but uh, we'll jump into this. So paper categories, matte paper, which everybody's usually had a bad experience with matte paper. They say, I don't want to print on matte paper, but matte paper can actually look really good. Matte paper is alpha cellulose. It's a tree paper. Rag papers, or what everybody likes to call fine art papers, they're just made of cotton. That's the only difference. Sometimes fine art papers are made of a mix of cotton and cellulose based on how you want the base to feel and how stiff you want it to be. Uh, RC papers, we remember those from the darkroom, glossy, luster, semi-gloss. Barita is a great paper technology that's really taken off in the last few years. It's a barium sulfate coating, generally over a cotton base, and it is very reminiscent of the air-dried fiber papers of the darkroom. So if you're looking for that to come back, you're looking for a Barita paper. And then we have some really fun stuff in digital printing. We have washi papers, which are traditional Japanese generally mulberry fiber papers, and then specialty papers. Moab makes a couple of metallics, a silver metallic, a white metallic. There's bamboo papers out there. There's hemp. There's all sorts of, of interesting things. So another thing is matte black versus photo black, another fun thing that we didn't have in the darkroom. So why do they look different? Photo black papers, or, or glossy papers as we like to call them, reflect more light, and they reflect the light directly back to the viewer. So colors look richer and blacks look darker. Matte papers, because they don't reflect as much light, they also scatter the reflection. So blacks look a little lighter and colors look a little less saturated. And there's no, this paper is better than that paper. It's all about what papers fit the work that you do and how you're gonna use the paper to extend and explain the image and, and kind of sway the viewer subconsciously. So they have no idea why you pick the paper. A lot of people don't even notice what paper you picked consciously but they look at your print and they think, wow, I love the softness and the depth in that. Well, you picked a matte paper or I love the, the punchy color, you know, like we would have used maybe Cibachrome if we were getting our film printed, but we'll use a metallic or a high gloss paper to do the same thing. So how do you choose what papers to use? Well, photo black or matte black, what we talked about. Tooth and surface texture. Do you want a textured paper? Do you want a smooth paper? Um, optical brighteners are things that some people consider. Others don't worry about it too much. Detailed tone and saturation, how does that play out? Matte papers will typically have a little smaller gamut, again, because of the way it plays with the light. How much does the paper cost? What will you do with the print? I, I always say that, you know, the prints that I give my mother to put in the refrigerator are on inexpensive luster because it's nearly indestructible. And when you splatter tomato sauce on a, you know, on a matte print, you're not going to be able to wipe it off of that. So personal preference and back to how does the paper affect the image? That's kind of the biggest one. And, and the best thing you can do is if you're on the hunt for a new paper, test a few different ones with the same image and see how they look. So getting back to the darkroom, if, 
if you used to work in the dark room or maybe you're not working in the dark room right now because you can't go to the rental dark room you've been going to, um, Juniper, Moab Juniper Barita is that fiber paper that we've talked about. Slick Rock Metallic Pearl is a high gloss. It's gonna give you more of a Cibachrome look. And then our Exhibition Luster gives you kind of an E surface or an N surface if you remember those old Kodak papers. And, and we'll look at a couple of papers here at the end to see how that translates over webcam. The one thing, alas, that you can't do very well in the scanner is the old test strip. And at least I affectionately miss test strips. So what affects print longevity? Basically the same thing that's always affected artwork longevity, whether it's paintings, darkroom prints, inkjet prints, everything else. For inkjet, it's the type of ink. Pigment ink will always outlast dye ink because pigment ink is made up of little physical particles of color. Uh, exposure to sunlight, UV, and humidity, the great killers of, of good artwork. So remember, please don't store your film or your prints in the attic or the garage or other place like, like that where they're gonna get hit with huge temperature swings and humidity swings. The type of paper, so all the papers that Moab makes, all the papers that Kansas makes, they're all archival, acid-free, neutral pH, that sort of thing. Handling, again, you're gonna treat your paper and your prints just like your film, cotton gloves, gentle storage, archival storage boxes. You can put the prints you know, back in the clear bag that, that the paper is, is shipped in. Um, and that's a barrier between that and, and whatever that bag is sitting in. You don't want to, you know, put your prints in a cardboard box or a plastic storage tote that you got at the hardware store, or whatever else, because those are not archival materials and will often transfer chemicals into your paper. And make sure you use archival materials when you're framing. I know a lot of cheap photo frames come with cardboard as the backer material. Well, that's nice high acid cardboard from who knows where, and that will quickly leach acid into your, into your fo frame photograph, turning it yellow. So it's okay to buy inexpensive frames, but the first thing you're gonna do is chuck that, that cardboard backer and use a nice piece of cotton backer board to go against your photograph and, and you'll save yourself a lot of headache down the road. And then again, storing it in, in archival boxes. So keeping our prints lasting a long time, same concepts, UV filtering glass, store your loose prints in an archival box, watch your humidity, and also important, allow your prints to off gas for 24 hours before you frame them or store them. So when you make a print, leave it on, the, on your desk, on your table overnight, and then the next day, pack it up for storage. A uh, quick little plug for our papers. If you're just starting out with inkjet printing and you wanna try something new, we make a sample box. It's two sheets of everything. It's around 20, $24. It's a great value per sheet. I think you guys there in the store pretty much always have them in stock. All the sheets are labeled. That's the, that's the best way to start out, especially if you're here with a lot of time on your hands and you want to start printing your scans. That's fantastic. Um, one quick little soapbox. This has become especially challenging in the last couple of years. Beware of software updates. Um, we've gotten a number of questions in the last couple of weeks from people that have updated to the newest Mac OS and have found that printer drivers don't let you do custom papers yet and Photoshop has color problems and, and all that sort of thing. So especially if you're using, you know, a scanner or a printer and you've got your workflow all dialed in, if it's working, don't update your software because chances are you're just going to get yourself a huge headache. Uh, early on, you're going to be testing things that no one's tested. Um, make sure you check if you have to update what's going to work, what's not going to work. Ask your friends. Don't ask the internet because the internet is full of interesting information, but ask your friends, hey, have you done this? Keep an older version of a backup, especially like your Lightroom library or other things like that, because once you update, you can't go backwards. Make time to test new software. If you have an older computer that you're going to get rid of that maybe worked really well with your scanner, maybe keep it. Keep it plugged into your scanner because there's no software update that's gonna make your scanner work better. It, it, it exists in that ecosystem. So you can save yourself a huge amount of headaches if you're very cautious about updating your software. And it, it didn't used to be that way, but the last couple of years, just, to, just as an aside, be, be um, skeptical of software updates. All right, questions? We, we totally, we totally have questions in the- I've got, the I've got some more time. I know we're at the hour mark. So if, if we want to do like 10 minutes or so of Q&A, we can absolutely do that. Perfect. If Let's people are willing to stick around. Jump in there. Um, thanks everybody for attending. We're going to go ahead and address these questions. Of course, we do have all these things at Looking Glass and yes. Oh, wait, we here we go. I forgot my sample packs. 
the so best. this was this was the image. I got to go back to full screen, don't I? Yep. Hold on. Uh, stop sharing. No. Yes. There it is. Stop share. All right. Perfect. So this is obviously hard to use. It's got a bit of a shine. This is the Barita paper. So not super shiny, but really a nice level of contrast. This is the same uh, image that I worked on in the in the presentation. And then the cotton rag. Again, you can see no surface sheen at all. And a little difference in apparent contrast, again, because it's scattering that light reflection. But it depends on do you want a real photorealistic print, number one, or do you want kind of a little more of a painterly, slightly more subtle print option number two. So these are kind of the big differences in paper. And again, it's a webcam. It's hard to show paper, but that's kind of the brief overview. So questions? Yeah, that's awesome. Um, OK, so best scanner. Um, recommendation for 35 millimeter mounted 35 millimeter slides and reflective art? Well, I mean, the, the V850 is going to be sort of the gold standard. Again, it's got two different lenses, one for reflective, one for transparent. Um, it's really designed to follow up on, you know, the, the Nikon film scanners of, of 10 and 20 years ago. Great. Really high quality work. So that's the one that I'd recommend. And and we think that you guys can maybe order that into the store. We're yeah, we, we need to take a look at that because when they updated um, from the 750 to the 850, I don't remember if Epson had a how to a switch. Anyway, that's nothing that anybody else needs to worry about. I will worry about that. Um, and I do want to go ahead and say like for reflective art, you know, keep in mind, like if you're scanning a print because you're wanting to do um clean it up or restore it if it has fused to glass in a frame you can try scanning that but scanning through the glass yeah, yeah. I, I just when we're talking about reflective services i feel like we have to talk about trying to get that glass out of the way <laughs> yeah yeah so at that point i would do two things if if it is fused to the glass try scanning with the glass see what happens again it's old glass you're probably gonna get some some refraction in there you can if you're so inclined, uh, photograph it, typically with lights at a 45 degree angle and a polarizer. But if it's something that you value that much that you really want to digitize it, take it to a lab, take it to a place that does restoration and, and artwork reproduction and stuff like that. And it may cost you, you know, $100, $200 for a really high quality capture of that, but they're going to do a phenomenal job. I mean, the, the folks that do reproduction and restoration that's what they do. You know, it's like having Annie Leibovitz take your portrait or something. You're going to get a bulletproof result. So if it's a family heirloom or something like that, you know, it can absolutely be worth the money to to outsource that and have it have it done right. Cool. Um, so I, we did have a question about a couple of really specific scanners. I'm just scrolling. There it was. Um, somebody said their father left them a Minolta Dimage Scan Elite 5400 film and slide scanner and mm -hmm. an Epson Perfection 3200 photo flatbed scanner. Both come with plastic film and slide holders. They're ancient with no instructions. Which one is better to try out first? Uh, no idea, but look at ViewScan and see if either or both of those are on his supported list, um, because that's going to be the best place to start. And, and I would do a quick search, you know, scanning with Minolta, Dimage, whatever the model number is, and I bet there's somebody with a blog out there that was in your same position that got this scanner and thought, well, let's figure it out. Um, that's kind of the great thing about nerdy photographers and film scanning is they really like to share whatever they learned about their quirky film scanner. And and I've I've found some really useful older stuff online, like the old Nikon film scanners. Nikon quit repairing those forever ago, well, there's a guy in Florida that bought out their inventory of parts and repairs them. And he's super nice, super responsive. Mine had to get a new part last year. He sent me photos of it being repaired. I mean, the customer service you don't get in, in high-end retail is this guy just working out of his garage and he did a fabulous job. So there's, I think film scanning is one of the few things where when you do a web search, if you're specific enough, you're going to get actually a really helpful result, which is nice. 
That's awesome. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's the kind of thing that we're finding all over the place, right? You know, all of the things that that uh, maybe the manufacturers are no longer supporting, we're finding people coming out of the woodwork who are like, I'm going to make this work. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's like restoring old cars, kind of the same thing. So it's it's a lot of fun. Good. Um, how would you go about scanning slides? Would you remove the border and meaning the the mount and use anti Newton glass to keep it flat? I would not mess with that. Typically, if they're mounted, they're pretty flat. Um, I think I've had better results in the V five hundred with mounted slides versus the the negatives and the negative carrier. You know, if you're going to try and remove them from the mount, that's a tricky process. And it can be. We also do sell uh, mounts so that you can do your own. And some of them do come with anti Newton glass in them. So you could actually remount them if you were feeling, you know, adventurous. Ambitious. Yeah. I think it all <laughs> depends on, you know, what your level of comfort is dismantling that mount and what's the, how valuable is that image to you and, and what do you want to do? Again, this is all kind of personal exploration. There's, there's not a lot of aesthetic right or wrong answers. Right. And I always, you know, recommend that people, you know, test it on one that isn't your favorite yeah. first. Yes. Um, and if you get a good result there, then, you know, you can handle with care and move forward with the thing that, that you're really ultimately wanting to do. Yeah, ab absolutely. Exactly. Um, if a scanner has a very specific focus distance, does placing the negative directly on the glass instead of in the film holder, which lifts the negative off the glass, not move the negative out of focus? Well, from what I've read, the point of focus is the top of the glass because that's where most of your stuff gets placed. And I think they're relying on the depth of field to be able to capture the mounted negative. Um, that's what I've kind of read so far. I haven't dug super far into it, but that'd be something to play with. But I think I think you're you're still golden putting it right on the glass because it doesn't have at least the the 500 600 Epson's. There's no differentiation between on the glass and right above it. Maybe with the 850 because it uses the two different lenses, it has different planes of focus. I'm I don't know. Yeah. If I had the sense that um, when you use the the provided like scanning software, if you choose like the negative, I, does it not ask you if you're using the holder to adjust? It does not. Okay. Not on the not on the five hundred six hundred. Okay. <laughs> you can tell I don't use that one. I use the big one. Um, so we've got somebody who is talking about software updates. Um, there, there's a lot actually written here. I think the main thing to focus on is Epson is notifying them that there's a new update um, and they're hesitant. So you talked about updated computer software, but what about updating the scanning software itself? Um, you know, look at the, look at what they're touting is the new features and, and that sort of thing. Often, often updates are done for compatibility if it's if it's an older device, um, you know, rarely do they introduce new features in older equipment with a software update. So it's just something to be conscious of. You know, one thing that's helpful is if you download and save the installer that you used. So you get a scanner this week and you download the, the Epson scan, whatever version it is, have a little folder somewhere that's called installers and, and save the save the software there so that maybe you do an update in a year and and something doesn't work right well epson will have disappeared that previous software you'll never find it online but if you save the installer you can easily go back to it um or you can you know test or or whatever else it's just it it tends to create a lot of headaches so it's just something to be aware of there's not a do this don't do this but it's just keep an eye on before you turn on auto updates for everything you've got um yeah, That'd no, good, agreed. I, like, yeah. I, I always recommend, you know, checking everything first when you're using peripherals, like a scanner or a printer or whatever, like when everything is tied into a certain operating system, you always want to check compatibility. And if you're doing, I mean, if you're doing a lot of printing or if you have a small gallery and you're doing printing, my advice is to actually pair a computer with that printer and don't update anything until the printer dies because 
four or five years from now, you know, they might change software, they might change something else. If you're doing additions, you can't get back that old thing. So if you, if you buy a wide format printer and you're doing addition to prints or you're selling a lot of prints, marry those two together. Don't update anything because you're probably printing from 16 bit TIFFs or Photoshop files. You can easily convert to TIFFs and, and, you know, software from 15 years ago will read our TIFFs from today because it's a, it's an archival standard. So don't be swayed by the glitzy marketing on, on new software, you know, set it, set it and forget it, get a system that works and, and let it work until there's some mechanical failure in that system that has and to be turn addressed. off auto updates because <laughs> it'll do it without you telling it to do it in your sleep. <laughs> um, let's see. So uh, let's see, checked last night, V850 in the US is sold out. That's not surprising at all. Nope. Um, do you have one of a scan five by seven, eight by 10 next directly on the grass, glass with great results? Yes, um, doing those larger negs or prints on the flatbed is, is, works great. Um, Epson specs for the V600 doesn't list working with Windows 10. So is ViewScan required? No idea. Not a not a Windows user in this office. Yeah. Um, good question. So that's a Google. That's a Google question. Yes. Um, and as always, you set yourself a 10 minute timer when you're using Google. Um, if you don't find the answer in 10 minutes, you quit the web browser and you use one of your lifelines. So you phone a friend or whatever else. But yeah, Google has a strict 10 minute limit on will you find your answer? Tip, yep. pro tip for Google. Um, for scanning eggs directly on a flatbed scanner, what is, oh, the special glass is called anti-Newton glass. Yes, and that was. Where do you get it? Let's, I, somebody asked earlier if we had it. We don't have it except in those slide mounts. Um, but glass companies, because they have had to order special glass for things. It was, the one that I found was scan, S-C-A-N, scan hyphen tech, T-E-C-H dot net, scan tech. Net. And if you just search for scanner anti-Newton glass, they pop right up in the top. But I, I like their stuff because they have it all pre-cut for um, like for the V600 film holders. They make little strips that so you can put the film holder on, put the glass on top of the, the negative and it keeps it in the right spot, but keeps it flat. So that was the one that, that seemed, I haven't bought it, but they seemed like the legit supplier of pre-cut anti-Newton glass. Perfect, thank you. Um, let's see, Toby's got an Epson 4870 and hasn't been able to scan negatives without a holder. So he ends up making a five by seven print, mm. then scan. I mean, that's a, it's a great workaround if it's not working. Great workaround, you know? yeah, yeah. No problem with that. You can also use a high resolution camera and take a picture of that sucker, whatever, yep. whatever works for you. Uh, V850 holders have three adjustable levels. You should test at all three levels, view at 100%, choose the one that is best for film transfer. I, I feel like there's a Zoom meetup that might come out of this for a lot of the folks. You know, like, hey, you just got your new 850? Well, come on down Monday night to the scan. Actually, not a bad idea. Um, the last one that we've got here, and this is a printing question. I'm is ready. there any drawback to changing out ink cartridges on high end printers? So thinking about splitting the cost on the printer with another photographer, but would want to keep, keep ink separate. Is that feasible? It, it is, but what I would do is you can very quickly find out online an approximate cost per square foot for the ink um, and then add five or 10% to that for head cleanings and that sort of thing and just keep a little sheet. Um, if it's a Canon wide format printer, they have the accounting utility that will do all this for you. And it will say, hey, you know, Emily burned up $14.75 in ink last night. And, and George, you burned up $28 in ink on Tuesday, right? So Canon software will keep track of that for you. I, you know, there's just keeping two sets of ink and, and keeping them agitated and, and how old is it? And did the cartridge dry out? and you're sort of introducing a level of complexity that doesn't need to be there. So I would just, you know, either keep a little tip jar on top of the printer and and measure when you're done and say, oh, 10, 10 square feet. Well, at a buck twenty-five a square feet, 
square foot, that's 1250. And I'm going to put $13 in the tip jar. And then whoever orders ink, you know, that goes into their ink fund or whatever else. But I would, I would find a, an accounting way to do that instead of, but it's the idea cool. of sharing a printer is, is great because the more you use a wide format printer, the happier it's going to be. They want to run their production machines and, and it makes that, that community, right? We can collaborate over prints. We can ask for advice because the hardest thing I think about photography, whether you're a professional or a weekender or uh, you're to your retirement hobby is, is sort of feeling like you're the only person, right? You're in your studio, you're in your office, you're in your den, you're making prints, you're, you're doing this, you're watching webinars, but there's nobody next to you to kind of collaborate with. And granted during COVID it's, it's harder, but to have somebody to, to share prints, to look at post-production, because the, the end result of all this is the print. And that's the, that's the great teacher. And it's the emotional connection. And it's, it's the gift. It's the postcard. It's, it's everything, right? That's, it doesn't matter if you're doing glass negatives, tin types, cyanotypes, cibachromes, darkroom wet prints, inkjet prints, contact prints from digital negatives, right? The print is why we're all here. So I think it's great if you can share a printer with somebody and, and collaborate and, and you get that, that community back that, that is so helpful and, and so much fun. So yeah, I'd say absolutely share a printer, but just figure out a way to account for the, the square footage printed and it'll be so much easier. Yeah, no, that's, thank you so much for that. That's a phenomenal recommendation. And tune in this evening at five o'clock for the print round table where we will preach to the choir for at least an hour about how amazing prints are. That's right. Uh, today's going to be good. Sunday's going to be good. Tomorrow also going to be good. So we've got so much more lined up for you. Evan, thank you. So Absolutely. Much. Thanks to everybody for coming. This was, this was fun. This was a new, a new topic. It's fun to explore a new topic. I really hope that you guys and gals got some useful information out of it and it was helpful. And um, I didn't share my screen, but if you want to email me, it's Evan, E-V-A-N, at legionpaper.com. If you forget that, you can also email info at legionpaper.com and someone will send it to me. Um, but thanks for coming and uh, thanks for hanging out and, and we'll see you later tonight. Awesome. See you guys later. Oh, and again, if anybody wants the recording of this, email me, Jen, J-E-N, at lookingglassphoto.com. I'm going to stop the recording.